Yo, 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 Thought Warriors. What is up? Higher Learning is on. It is I, Van Lathan Jr. And it's me, Rachel and Lindsay. All right, so look, I'm going to take the glasses off because Rachel said it's better if I take the glasses off, and I, and I agree. Thank you. But I want to let somebody, I want to let people know something. A lot of people are asking where you can get these glasses, all right? And it's one place that you can get them. These are Crown Society frames for my man, 19 Keys. All right? 19 Keys. Don't be afraid of 19 Keys. Don't be afraid of a black man that's unafraid. You don't have to agree with everything that he says, but don't be afraid to support 19 Keys. Crown Society. I'm going to take them off right now. All right? We're going to get into the podcast. Look, Crown Society. They're sturdy. They look great. I'm going to put them right here so that we can still, they can still be looking at Rachel. Right now. <laughs> I'm here in person with you. I want to see you, okay? But you, I, I want to see you. Hey, Rach. Rach hey, Rach. I didn't ask for that to come Rach, off. I'm going to be honest with you. That is a legitimate, thank you. legitimate thing to say. Thank you. Thank you. But I don't want that to be seen as a rejection of the Crown Society. So look. I like your new look. I like it. Um, How's your weekend? My weekend was fine. What did I do? Oh, I, uh, I was able to successfully continue to break in my Spalding official NBA basketball. Yeah. And what does that entail? So when you buy an NBA basketball, an official NBA basketball, the ball is not ready to play. Okay. But there's a problem. Hmm. If you take your official NBA basketball to the gym, okay. nobody wants to play with it. Is that bad? It's hard. <laughs> it's yeah it's when you first break the ball out it's a little slick it's genuine leather so it lasts a very long time but you have to break the ball in and it takes a while so what I've been doing for the last this is why is it funny you laugh too you chuckle keep going but what <laughs> I've been chuckle. doing is just getting up and going to break the ball in and because nobody will play with the ball, it's just me running laps around the court and dribbling the ball, pound dribbling the ball, shooting the ball. Just, I shout out Irv Roland, my homeboy who, who works in the league. He works with Kyrie Irving uh, with the Dallas Mavericks. Shout out to Irv. I hit Irv every day and I show him pictures of the basketball. I'm like, is the ball broke in yet? Is the ball going to get any softer? Mm -hmm. It's an, To me, it's a much superior basketball, but you can't get people to play with it. No one will play with it, especially at Equinox where there are all these Wilson Evolutions, which is a composite ball, which is a lot softer, easier on the rim. They only want to play with that. They won't play with my official NBA ball, so I got to break it in myself. And you're almost there. I don't think so. I'm not sure. I don't know. You don't know I, because I, nobody will play with I, I, I don't know. It, nobody will play with the ball. I know that it's different than what it was when I bought it. It's It's got a lot of different stuff to it than what it was when I bought it, but it's the ball is changing color. It It's just such a superior basketball to play with, but you can't get anybody to play with it. So why did you get it? If it's not a good ball to play with, nobody will play with you. Doesn't it sound like it's just for show? Like maybe you should just have it as something you keep at the house because it's an official NBA ball and maybe it isn't meant to be played with. Well, first of all, they play in the NBA with the ball. They, professional basketball players. Those balls are different. Whoa! <laughs> Heard it as soon as I said it. <laughs> Whoa, Heard father. <laughs> oh, father. Why don't you tell us about the balls in the NBA, Rachel? I don't know anything about that. Yeah, I don't know I'm anything not about not that. But I'm I'll, retired. <laughs> <laughs> um... Yo, so look, it, but because, okay, there is a reason. Okay. I'm going to drop another name, okay? Lethal Shooter. Okay. So I remember I went to this run that Lethal Shooter had back in the day. Shout out to Lethal Shooter and Jack. Remember we, Jack McClinton. Remember we had, <laughs> shout out to Jack, everybody. One of our favorite guests. One of our favorite guests. Shout out to my, <laughs> my guy, Jack. We went to this run. And there was a lot of people there, but because Lethal's a pro, he will only play with the NBA ball. Mm -hmm. And I had never played with it before. And so when I was there, I was like, hey, I don't know. It's it's an acquired thing. Like, if you just go from sure. what you're used to playing with to that. And so I was like, hey, you know, if 
if the pro runs are doing this, why don't I try to, you know what? <laughs> it's a challenge. I want it to be challenged. There we go. Do so that. I wanted to, I wanted to, to, and I didn't, when I bought it, I didn't know you had to break it in though. Like literally when I first got the ball, I'm like, this sucks. <laughs> and then I called Irv and Irv was like, nah, bro, you got to play with, you got to, you know, you got to break it in. It has to be broken in. I was like, how long does that take? Well, I was like two months. I'm like two months before the ball is ready to play? Two months? And he was like, yeah, we practiced with them for a long, long time. And and then, you know, they then they get used. And so for me now, that's my whole life. My whole life is getting up, I'll go work out, and then I'll be on the court for two hours, dribbling, <laughs> shooting. It's not working. Just go, it is. So when when it is ready, will you play better? Do you have a better game? Is your shot better? Like all this work for what? Do you dribble better with it? I want to. I really want to understand. You do dribble better with okay, it. Okay. Okay. You do we'll dribble better with it. And then the answer is I don't know. <laughs> we'll soon find out. Yeah, I I don't know what happens because once it's broken in, people will always choose the Wilson Evolution, <laughs> the composite ball over. <laughs> What's that thing over there? Yeah, I saw you were um. You were the only black person. Did, would you like to tell people what you text me? What? Like, like what? <laughs> Let's look <laughs> at it right Would you like now. to tell people what you, so, so I went on my last ski trip for the season because okay. as everybody knows, I've really stepped into ski culture. I, it's been whatever you want to call it, my new hobby. Love it. Love it so much. I went with a different group of girls. Yeah. We went to Vail this time, Beaver Creek. New mountains for me. So it was a little bit of a challenge. I was trying something new. And I, we got all dressed up. We're in our furs. Everybody had a cowboy hat on. Mm -hmm. And we decided to all line up together and take a picture. I'm thinking we look cute, nice, friendship. That's what we're showcasing. Yeah. And then I get a message from Bam that says, what? One nigga nights. There was nobody for me to laugh with. I couldn't show that to anybody. Mm -hmm. I just had to hold that inside. Sometimes you, you have were a, wrong. Sometimes you have a one nigga <laughs> night, and you don't even realize it's a weekend. it. Like yeah, a whole one nigga week. You don't even realize that it. Like is so true. Yeah, you don't you even don't. realize it. Like I remember until you see another black person. Until you see it, right? I remember. Shout out to Brett and Dan, my roommates, in like 2007 or whatever. But like I got into this thing to where I would go with them to like Busby's, which was this place to go to out here in LA. If people know Busby's for young, basically postgraduate LA singles, you know? Mm -hmm. I was a couple of years older than them. So I was like 26. They were like 23, 24, 25, something like that. Uh -huh. Busby's was a place that you go. And I'm in the car and it's me and it's Dan and it's Brett. It's Nick fucking Sheptak. It's Ross. It's like these are these are the whites of life. These were my white homies. And I'm looking around, Joe. And I'm looking around, I'm like, damn, this is a one nigga night. <laughs> this is a, actually a one nigga night. I'm the only motherfucker here. And then Will started coming around, Will gelling, and then that was better. But you were having a one nigga night. I had I had a weekend. A whole one nigga a weekend. Whole I don't weekend. really do it that much anymore. I don't do, I, I rarely do it. And it, it, it's hard with like with that because you know not, now that I'm into skiing, people are letting me know, hey, there's Black Ski Week. Hey, there's certain things that you can do. So next ski season, I want to be a part of it because it's a little lonely sometimes, yeah. right? We go out. I had a great time though. Love my friends. Great time, but you know. Yeah. You start longing for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's the whole thing. You're there with them. They're saying stuff. You start, right. You start longing for your people a little bit. So next week, I'm uh, next year, uh -huh. I'm going to try to tap in to find some, some of my black skiers. Because even when I leave them and I'm in the village, mm -hmm. you know, I don't see it. We're not there. I have a question I have to ask you before we get into this, this topic. Am, okay. I'm, we, why am I nervous? We have a couple of people on the podcast today. We have Justin Sylvester on the podcast You guys today. asked for that. Yeah, that's what Justin I put Sylvester. up a, a fan thing. A lot of people wanted to know. They wanted to hear from Justin. Justin Sylvester. We're going to talk to Justin Sylvester. Mm -hmm. We're also going to talk to P. Frank Williams about the uh, uh, the documentary on um, Hulu about Freak Nick. Freak Nick, the wildest party never told. It's on Hulu right now. We're going to talk to P. Frank about it. He's one of the creators. Um, but I begin a lot of questions about the playbook. Oh, well, it's your playbook. What are they asking? I'm questions. a lot of questions like, from... The Watts. Oh. And they want to know. 
And wow. what do they want to know? Wow. I want everybody to check that response from Rachel. I don't think you're reading my response correctly. When I said I'm getting a lot from the, I want I want somebody to break down Rachel's response and the glee That's actually that not what was behind over her face when I said that there have been why Actually men the asking look on my face playbook. was like why Just wait till you see it. That's my that might have been how it felt. Okay, well the look on my face was why do you care? It looks like you're trying to have a one nigga life. <laughs> the only nigga in your house. I'm not Boy. gonna say anything. All right, so I'm definitely not. So let me let me say this: Are white guys are they eligible for the playbook? Okay, I don't want to discriminate. Okay, but where I am in my life right now, I need black men. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I'm gonna say. Okay, look, you won't turn your back on I, love. I I believe it is out. I just y'all gotta give me some space for a second. Right. I need I need to come home for a little bit. You need to come home for a little bit. Okay. <laughs> I need to come home. Never say never. Never say never. I get it. But where I am right now, you, you gotta. I it, it, I think this is fair. I think so too. Yeah. I spent seven years away. Right. Okay. Now it's time to come. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We got to talk about Candace Owens. Another side of this break. Okay, um, so a lot of news in the Owens sphere here. Uh, we're going to start with the Daily Wire. Um, ben Shapiro's Daily Wire we have right here cuts ties with Candace Owens. That's only partly true. So Ben Shapiro is the founder of the Daily Wire and the CEO emeritus of the Daily Wire. But he does not have, despite the influence that I'm sure that he has, he does not have an official position with the Daily Wire. So I do not believe that Ben Shapiro he could, can't solely do he it. He can't fire her. He could right. probably influence sure. uh, someone to say, hey, we don't want Candace Owens around anymore and then fire her from the Daily Wire. Now, um, it, he founded it, and I think uh, uh, Matt Walsh and others run it right now. I actually looked it up. I'm not sure. Um, actually, look up who runs the Daily Wire. I'm not sure. Actually, it might be Jeremy Boring or whatever the guy's name was. He used to be friends with um, or used to be partners with a guy I know named Joel David Moore. Joel David Moore. He's an avatar, great basketball player, cool guy from okay. Oregon. Um, she's gone. She's gone because, really, because of her criticism of Israel in uh, in media for the last X amount of months since the October yes seventh uh, um, uh, Hamas attack and the terrorist attack, and then the subsequent um, massacre that's taken place in. Palestine. She is uh, in Gaza specifically. She is very, 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 very outspoken on this. And that has caused a rift between her and the brass at the Daily Wire. It got worse and worse and worse. We saw her fighting with Ben Shapiro and now she is out. She tweeted, the rumors are true. I am finally free. Um, she had joined the Daily Wire in 2021. Um, but yeah, she's been very outspoken about it. Um, before this, I was looking on the internet on okay. Valuetainment. Okay. You ever watch Valuetainment? I do not. Do you know what it is? No. Valuetainment is a platform by this guy named Patrick Bet David. Okay. And he has a bunch of different people on there. I remember I first saw Valuetainment back in the day. For some reason, he had Kobe on there. I'm like, what the fuck? How does this guy get it? He's a former insurance guy down there. Is it a, is it a big thing? Yeah. Okay. But it's conservative. I've seen Sam Cedar on there. I've seen other people on there. Roland Martin did it one time. Um, it's conservative, but there was a guy from the Daily Wire that was on there, uh, Ruben, and he said, I think that Candace Owens won't be around for very long because I think she wants to get fired. And then when I saw that in tandem with her being on uh, Joe Budden's podcast and The Breakfast Club, we're going to talk about that appearance a little bit later, uh, I was like, oh, well, it seems that Candace is getting out there a little bit more, but maybe she sees her time at the Daily Wire coming to an end. Uh, 
What are your thoughts on this? What are your thoughts on the end of the relationship I, between Candace Owens and The Daily Wire? I mean, obviously, I don't have no inside scoop, but it wasn't that surprising. Yeah. I mean, if you've been paying attention to it, she has been very vocal. I mean, Ben Shapiro and her have literally been having Twitter wars. So that started in last year, carried into this year. She's been outspoken. And, and, and even more so, there's certain things that she's been doing where she's trying to reach outside of her typical audience, which now makes even more sense with this announcement and her starting her new platform and her asking people to buy into what she's doing as she's trying to recruit more people to, you know, whatever it is that she's putting out there. So I wasn't, I saw it and I was like, all right, that that's on par. I think I would have been more shocked if she stayed longer than the than a year. Mm. I mean, this is six months since they started at least publicly beefing from what we know. For all we know, they've been beefing behind the scenes as well. But I think, you know, to a Ben Shapiro and whoever else was in that decision to um, let her go, I think that, yeah, like she had gone too far for them. She wasn't, she wasn't behaving. How about that? She wasn't behaving like she should for them. It's one thing for her to step out and condemn other people. But the moment that she started saying something that wasn't in line with what they believe, they got to cut her loose and find a new one. That's the fascinating part of this because something dawned on me. Candace Owens is a diversity hire. <laughs> well, she didn't know that. But she is. Of course. Unequivocally, there's no way to... She's a diversity hire. Candace Owens, for all the talk about DEI and what it means to have somebody on your platform to occupy a space solely because they are black. Mm -hmm. Solely because they are black, right? That's what people are saying. That's what people, the right paints DEI as this thing to where you couldn't possibly be qualified. Right. That there's no value in it, right? Because I could tell you right now that there is value in having diversity in the room, diversity of thought in the room, yeah. Yeah. just for sharpening your own ideas, your own perspective, for changing the way you view and look at people, and for making a country that is more functional and deeper. I think diversity in and of itself is a virtue. But people don't believe that. People say, hey, they, they envision this, this America where straight white men are the best at everything in every situation, and the minute that you deviate one iota, from their prominent place in America, you get a less effective version of the country. So anything other than that is DEI. Candace Owens has long been somebody that looked at herself and was looked at by people as going against what the grain is, right? Going against the grain and saying things that might offend you but that she believes are true. And she's been hailed for that on the right. Hailed for it. Yep. Oh, my God. Candace is willing to say this. Right. And it's true. She thinks freely. And the blacks just don't want to hear it. Right, right. And the left just doesn't want to hear it. And the blank and the blank and the blank just doesn't want to hear it. Mm hmm That's only okay if she is talking to the blacks. That's only okay if she's talking to the left. All the talk of diversity hires and all the talk of what it means to hire somebody just because they are black, just because they represent a thing. Yeah. All of the talk about how corrosive that is, that's exactly what she was. Because the moment that she became something that was a little bit out of step with her, they nuked her. Mm -hmm. And they did it publicly. Yep. And they did it, did it prominently. And they made no bones about it. They didn't want the, oh, my God, this is the fire brand. Oh, my God, this is. They didn't want that. What they wanted was a black person to shoot at black people. Yep. And in order for that to happen, that person has to be black. Right. So all this talk about oh, my God, diversity for diversity's sake or whatever, whatever, whatever. Now, there is an ideological aim that they have here, but she's a diversity hire, and I'm seeing them everywhere. 
Whitlock is a diversity hire at the goddamn... Is that right? No, that's not where he's now. I think he's at the Blaze. The Blaze, the Blaze, the Blaze. So it's like, I'm watching people that are talking about DEI and that are, that have... Look, I'm not going to say I don't know anything about being a token. Well... We could have called this... We... We could have called this podcast... (laughs) That would have been two funny. Talk, two tokens? We, we could have called call this podcast. We, we, we really could have. It would have been funny. <laughs> but what I'm saying is, is that that just dawned on me. It's like all of the free thought, we're free speech absolutists, all of that stuff, out the window. The Candace Owens, the Whitlocks that you mentioned, these type of people other themselves. And that's what I love so if I had to love, I guess, anything about this, not that I like to see people get torn down, but it revealed something to her that she's never going to admit because they other themselves and think, oh, I'm not like them. I I couldn't be a diversity hire because I deserve to be here. I'm this, 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 and this. Those other people aren't deserving to be here. They don't have the knowledge. They don't have the education. They don't have, they're not that kind of thing. That's how they, they truly think like that. I have come across a number of Black people who other themselves from other Black people and take pride when they're big upped by white people because, you know, they see it as a prize. I don't know, I guess. I don't know. I don't think that way. I'm not saying Candace Owens is smart. I'm not saying she's not good with words. I'm not saying she's good at the particular... She saw those things. Look, we're going to talk about it. What I am saying is that it's clear that Candace Owens existed at the Daily Wire Always. For a specific reason. Keep naming them. Prager U. Prager U, Turning Point, all, all of these of places. She might be still be working with Prager U, but she's been through a lot of the different. Yeah. You know, it turned out. She's been through a lot of the different uh, like organizations in the whole nine. Um, and it's like, it's that that's the thing. So when it, when this happened, I was like, oh, so you know. It's it's just interesting to me. Years and years and years, and we're going to get into it, of saying things that are offensive about Black people that call into the very concepts uh, of solidarity, that call into question the concepts of solidarity, Blackness, identity within our community, and everybody is waving pom-poms. Mm. The minute she is slightly critical, mm-hmm. slightly critical, Mm-hmm. of what's happening over there and it is perceived it's perceived it's not really it's perceived as a slight at a different culture and she gets nuked okay that's the news there now the second part of this is that Candace Owens appeared on the breakfast club she appeared on a Joe Budden's podcast before she appeared on the breakfast club and I didn't see it it was behind the paywall which I'm almost not mad <laughs> That he made people pay for that. I don't know. It just made me laugh. Yeah. I don't. Ha- I didn't like that he did the interview. Obviously, we talked about that, but it made me laugh that. Well, you got to pay for. It. I'm gonna make money off of this. Yeah. I mean, it, uh, he he. But, it just but, made me laugh. But Umar was behind the paywall too. I think for Joe Budden, but I think there were so many com- super compelling parts of the Umar interview that busted through the paywall. Mm-hmm. I did see some of the Candace stuff on there, but uh, the the Umar stuff just went viral. The whole. Uh, thing between Umar and Ish where it was like, are you mixed race? No. Are you a bunny hopper? And, and it's just funny. It's Umar is just, just funny. And a couple of back and forth. He there. is funny. I'm not going to... I can't funny. stand him, but he's just funny. funny. Just funny. Um, I hope to have him on the podcast. Would love it. Open the playbook back up then. <laughs> <laughs> uh, she was on The Breakfast Club. Did you see it? How'd you feel about it? I hate I watched it. Let me ask you a real, gen- real question. Sure. What the fuck is going on over there? At the Breakfast Club. Okay. And I'm dead ass serious. Uh-huh. I watched that interview. I had people hitting me up about that interview before I sat down and watched it. Mm-hmm. The only reason I pressed play is because I knew we were going to talk about it on this podcast. It and we podcast. have to. Yeah. Right? We have to. Mm-hmm. I watched it and I kept thinking, how is this happening? And why is this happening? And what the fuck is going on over there at the Breakfast Club? Mm-hmm. Charlemagne, I know we talked about this before, has um, started to have more political conversations. They start to talk about things like that. And I understand it's even more necessary in 2024 and even more necessary in an election year like this with Trump versus Biden. We've talked about that. Jess and Envy 
And I mean, from what I watch on this, nobody seemed ready to have that conversation with her. And that's why I say what is going on, because it clearly was. And but they ended this way. You just want you literally said we should have different voices and we should allow them to talk and share their views and for people to just take what they want. There's nothing wrong with that. But when somebody tells a lie or somebody says things that are false and they're doing it to sway you to their beliefs or, you know, like it could be anything, religion, then that's problematic. And you have a duty on your platform to stop that. Mm -hmm. You have a duty to say something, yeah. especially if you claim to be, you know, into politics or, or, or down with that. And then it's just as black people, I guess, laughing and kikiing with Candace Owens Envy barely asked questions. Jess just ad-libbed. She could, she might as well have been an audience member. It was just extremely frustrating to watch. That's just my general thought. Mm -hmm. Before diving into anything else, I was very upset because I do feel like a platform like that, we said before, people go on The Breakfast Club because they know the Breakfast Club has the ear of Black people. Yeah. I was very upset at the way that they handled all of that. Mm. I'm not saying it had to be confrontational. But they could have challenged her on specific issues. And they fell to me right into exactly what it is that she is doing, which is trying to act like she's down for us now, or she loves Black culture when she has said so many particular things that are negative, hateful, and racist about Black people, and then empowered other people who are not Black to do the same. So this is what I'll say. I was disappointed with the interview for sure, without a doubt. I was disappointed in the interview, and I talked to Charlemagne multiple times this weekend. I was disappointed in the interview because of what The Breakfast Club has meant to me. Now, no platform is a perfect platform. Sure. Right? But what The Breakfast Club has always meant to me, uh, particularly when they do interviews with political figures or people who have political talking points, is that the Breakfast Club then is like a, um, and not for everyone, 40 million black people in the country, but the Breakfast Club becomes, to me, what it becomes a measure of how you act when you're around black people. Talked about this before. Remember Lee Zeldin on the Breakfast Club, different, different people, the big Ramaswamy on the Breakfast Club, they act differently when they're there and you get to see, they do. They act differently when they're no, there. No, you're right. Hillary Clinton acts differently when they're there. Uh, uh, Nikki Haley acts differently when they're on there. To me, the most important thing is seeing how they comport themselves when they think they're talking to black people. Mm -hmm. I've said this before. There's no reason for me to watch another Nikki Haley interview or another Vivek Ramaswamy interview. I've seen a bunch of them. I've seen town halls. I've seen this. I've seen that. You watch them on The Breakfast Club, um, whether or not they are talking to Black America, they think that they are. Mm -hmm. And so the way that they act when they think that they are is very important. They get nervous over certain questions. They get, they get asked questions that they haven't been asked before. They get asked direct questions, right? And a lot of these people get asked questions that they didn't ask Candace Owens, even though ideologically she's on the same side with these people. Yeah. Like, for example, you're talking to Candace Owens about this is her Black American coming out party because honestly, <laughs> her 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 entire issue was that Black spaces wouldn't invite her on. Right. It's not that she wouldn't do them. So anyone that's saying that like uh, she's doing the Breakfast Club and she's doing Joe Budden and she's doing these things now, that's only partly true. I mean, it it it's definitely the timing is definitely interesting. But she would always complain that she would never be invited but on allegedly, those allegedly, Roland Martin has invited her so many times and she's never gone. Perhaps. Maybe she doesn't want it with Roland. <laughs> I, I mean, wouldn't could, if it, I were like, her. It, like, it could be. It could be. I would think, I mean, she def she had Mark Lamont Hill on her show. So I, I would think that she had Hawk Newsom on her show. Several times. Right. Yeah. So I wouldn't think that that would be a problem for her to, to but maybe she doesn't want to go on there for whatever reason. Uh, maybe that's too much of an away game for her. But what I'm saying is the questions that are asked to those people, they're asked to them, I feel like, in order to vet them for the audience. In order to vet them to say, hey, uh, we're getting to the point with this person about how they feel about the lives of Black Americans 
how they feel about black people. And these are the questions that we're going to ask. Yeah. So Candace Owens is on the show. She's not asked about reparations, right? Which is something that almost every white politician that will go on The Breakfast Club will be asked about. She's not asked about things that she said that black people cared about. Correct. Right? She's not asked about any of that. Right. She's not asked about George Floyd. Mm -mm. I'm not, I talked to him and I, he told me, I don't, I don't want to get into our conversation, but I don't think they were looking at it like that. I agree. They said what they were looking at. I don't at think it they as. were looking at it like that. I'll say this The Breakfast Club is a conservative platform. Are you saying because of who they're owned by? No. I'm saying that because if you do a comment autopsy about it, like in the comments of that, they're overwhelmingly positive, right? Like overwhelmingly positive. And there are two reasons why. One is because Candace Owens essentially gave a stump speech when she was on there. And there wasn't a lot of challenging of her ideas or of her past or things that she said. And then number two, there is an, there's truth on both sides of this. One is that Black Americans are much more conservative than we give them credit for. Way more conservative. I so you can go on there, be vaguely anti-LGBT or minimizing at the very least. You can go on there and say that uh, feminism is bad and black men need to be head of the households. And you can go on there and say, hey, the strength of black people is in the black family, right? Those are three things that are going to be non-controversial to a lot of the people that come from the community that I come from, right? Whether or not we need to do deeper litigation of those things or whatever, those are going to be three things that are going to be like, oh, maybe. Like, we're making too much of a big deal out of this. We need black men to be the to leaders in the household, and we need black families. You go there and you say that, people are going to be like, oh, that makes a lot of sense. And I've never heard this from her before. The, the, the question yes. is, like, what else is not being talked about? It's half-truths. Like, and that's, that's where the frustration lies. Exactly. And there were certain things that she said that I'm like, yeah, I understand, like, why you don't trust the government. I understand, you know, like, why you don't always trust the media. But that's the thing. The people who are in the comments, they're just listening to what she's saying without actually doing any follow-up. And that is where, to me, somebody like Charlemagne comes in, is, who is, I I would think, well-versed and well-read on, hey, well, if you're going to say this about LBJ, make sure let's talk about what happened to them in the 80s, to Black people in the 80s, too. Like, if you're going to talk about this side of things, you know, like, oh, I'm going to talk about education and this and what's not being taught. But I'm also a part of PragerU who puts out these silly little stories about slavery and Black history that are in factually incorrect as, all, as well. Like, they're just, to me, there just could have been a better balance. I, I want to say this. You know, Jess is a comedian. Jess Hilarious is a comedian. She's a comedian. She's on The Breakfast Club to do the rumor report, Jess with the Mess. She has a lot of insights into things. Uh, she's a comedian. Typically, and and I'm not saying that to, to diminish her at all because I think she's very talented and she's incredibly smart, but I wouldn't expect her to do the heavy lifting in a in a in a in a in a, um an interview with Candace Owens. I wouldn't even expect Envy to do it. Really, in this interview, the person that normally does the heavy lifting and, and litigates and, these things yeah. is Charlemagne. If you if if we're if we're being fair, even when there is a politician that is is there, it's Charlemagne who does sure, these things. Sure. I think he went about this 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 uh this interview in a way that was just having a conversation with Candace Owens. <clears throat> Excuse me, that was just having a conversation with her. And I think if there wasn't if there weren't things in her past to talk about, that would have been fine. Mm -hmm. But if we just... Go ahead. No, keep going. I, I just was going to... The only thing I was going to add to that is, yes, if there weren't things that, to talk about that she said, and that if she... If it wasn't so obvious to me what she's doing. Right. So, Candace Owens, to me, has trafficked in anti-blackness for years. Mm -hmm. And anti-blackness in a very specialized and insidious way right? There's this fallacy of respectability um, that people on the black right sometimes deal in. And it's this sort of amorphous belief, uh, not really solidified, but everything gets back to the basic premise that black people have to earn justice in America. Mm -hmm. 
which is like at the center of respectability politics, that black people have to earn justice, that uh, that the justice isn't guaranteed, but based on something. Black people don't want to have to earn justice in America. They want to know that justice in America is real. They want to know that equity in America or equal rights in America is real. They don't want to talk about why they don't have it. They want the actual belief that it exists. Mm -hmm. And so when we talk about things that happen, particularly events that people coalesce around, what we're really talking about is whether or not these things exist in a framework of justice and equality. Yes. And Candace, time and time again, subverts those things Mm -hmm. and wants to, and she plays this, intellectual sleight of hand that wants to make you look at something different. Correct. And not on what it is that we're actually talking about. Mm-hmm. Well, there were certain things that she said, and you could you could sit through this interview. We would need like three podcasts to sit through and talk about everything that she said and to go back and forth with it. Something that she kept saying, two things. One, she kept talking about how Black people were better under Trump, right? That was her talking point. She kept saying it over and over again, not acknowledging where, how rates have gone down currently where we are, not acknowledging that an administration before may have impacted where we were in those years, not acknowledging certain things that had happened. But she also, like you said to your point, points to a specific thing and wants you to look at it. She really honed in on LBJ. She really honed in on welfare. She really talked about the Black family, the lack of Black men, how Black women were incentivized not to have Black men leading in their homes, not to have families so they could get a check. It's playing into these racial stereotypes that are extremely problematic pretty much what Ronald Reagan did when he kept talking about that whole queen of welfare thing, which was not correctly put out there in a way to scare white people about how black people and brown people are incentivizing the government to to get wealth. The thing with Candace was she talks about LBJ and she talks about welfare and she talks about black people and how they were better before. She doesn't tell the whole thing. When she, she said black people were better in Jim Crow, but doesn't acknowledge that Black people are suffering in so many areas outside of the economy, which has an impact on how Black people are. She only talks, she doesn't talk about the racism. She doesn't talk about the lack of laws. She doesn't talk about discrimination. She does not talk about Black people and how they suffered in the 80s under Reaganomics. She does not talk about how that created a racial wealth gap even larger than before. She doesn't include these things and says one thing where Black people say, huh, I never thought about welfare like that. I didn't know that about LBJ without telling the whole truth. That's something that really bothered me about her. And then specifically, she talked about um, how the media says things that she doesn't say. She says they take a headline and they don't put it in quotes because that's not exactly what she said. And she gets caught in semantics of, I didn't say those exact words. But what she doesn't acknowledge is the implication of what she's saying. She said, they said, I said, their racism doesn't exist. What she said was, stop taking away our self-confidence by telling us that we can't because of racism, because of slavery, I have never been a slave in this country. The implication there is because I'm not a slave and because racism is tied to slavery, the racism is not the same anymore, as if it's not prevalent, as if it's not keeping us down, as if there aren't systems, as if the ideas and institutions and executions from slavery have not affected us to where we are today in 2024. Mm -hmm. That, to me, is still saying, you are saying in a way or implying that racism isn't there. And that, to me, is what she does so dare I say, artfully, Mm -hmm. with using her words in a way of saying, I never said this specifically, but what do you imply when you said that? Just like when she was talking about Fonnie Willis. Oh, I called her a ghetto superstar. That's a great song. She is a superstar. No, you called her a ghetto superstar. What are you trying to imply? That's something else that they didn't push back. Anyways, I can keep going, going, keep going. No, no, no. I mean, no. I mean, that's essentially what we're talking about, right? We're talking about uh, the difference is really in philosophy more than it is in anything yeah. else, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you were to say that Black people, uh, that racism is gone or that racism, that you've never been a slave so there's no racism, right. I guess what I would say to anyone who felt that way or thought that is what does the legacy of America's racist past represent, right? Like what, w- when did the spigot get turned off to where Everything was equal, and then you move on. When I say equal, I don't mean 
totally equal because things will never be totally equal. I mean, equal in the sense that you don't have to worry about the albatross of systemic discrimination. You don't have to worry about systemic exclusion. You don't have to worry about the, the, the disparities environmentally and politically where you live and your achievement. And if those things are gone, then we don't need to talk about them. Then what we can do is we can say, you know what? It's all our fault. Mm -hmm. It's all our fault that things aren't moving the way. I'm listening. I'm willing to have that conversation about what it is that we should be doing, but I'm willing to have it in the context of what should we be doing to overcome the very obvious, obvious systemic issues that America presents. Sure. And those issues are not, um, uh, those issues are inextricably linked to history. They're inextricably linked to situations. Like if you talked about the uh, the Greenwood Massacre as a, um, as a one-off thing in history, it's a terrible, terrible occurrence, right? But if you talk about it in the way that it affected Black home ownership, not just in Tulsa, but in Oklahoma, Black home ownership, which then is the fundamental building block of a of American wealth, home ownership is. When you talk about what was taken out of the community with something like that that happened, mm -hmm. then you start to get to the reasons that we need to talk restoratively when we talk about justice. When you start to talk about what it meant to keep black people out of homes, what it meant to keep black people in certain places, what it mean to what it meant to do all of that, you start to talk about, okay, well, what do we have to do now to address this? And is there a link and a connection to the past and to the present? We're not living in the past totally when we're saying these things because we're talking about statistics and realities that exist now. And I think one of the, the, the main goals of the right is to say that that conversation doesn't have merit. Mm -hmm. That the only conversation that has merit is a conversation that says America is the greatest place on the world in the world. And because it's the greatest place in the world, your fate in America is based upon what you make it. Okay. If you parse that apart. Your fate in America is based upon, to me, not what you make it, but how you attack the challenges that America throws at you. Mm -hmm. And the question is, very, very, very directly, how can we address those challenges. No one is ever saying that we are going to take them and throw them out. Sure. How can we address the challenges that America presents disproportionately for some of its people? That's the thing. That's it. It's very simple. It's not anything that anybody has to cry about. It's a very simple set of intellectual truths that you need to get on top of. Mm -hmm. Candace Owens has earned the belief that people uh, think that she's anti-black. And if she's going to clear that up, and if she's going to demonstrate that she's not, then that's on her. I, actually, I sent you something, uh, uh, Candace Owens. Um, I just want to make give an example here. This is after the death of George Floyd. Um, I'm beginning to a couple of other examples of things that I think that she said were anti-black, but this is after the death of George Floyd. This is what Candace Owens said regarding Derek Chauvin. These were subsequently called at him. Now, there is no dispute and no argument that you're going to hear from me that what Derek Chauvin did was right. There is not. And the reason why I'm not talking about Derek Chauvin is because we actually have reached a consensus in this society. Everybody agrees that what he did was wrong. Everybody is happy that he is arrested no matter what color you are. And every single person hopes that justice is served to George Floyd's family. That is not why I'm doing this video. This is not a defense of Derek Chauvin. This is not a video to say that when you are a criminal, you deserve to die. Nope, none of that. I want to talk about martyring criminals. I want to talk about suddenly putting them Her point about George Floyd, because she talked about George Floyd, was that it was a very almost boring critique from the right that George Floyd was such a bad guy that we shouldn't make a big deal out of the fact that he was killed or we should make a big deal out of him. Mm -hmm. Right? Once again, a vague theory that justice is earned. Uh, for everything that George Floyd was, he was other things. 
I come from a place where uh, a lot of the people that I knew, a lot of the people that I loved, a lot of the people that I was around were criminals. And some of the crimes that they committed were heinous. When those people died, people cried. And you know what we remembered them as? Brothers and fathers and sons and people that made us laugh and people that could dance and people that can sing. I never, ever, ever went to a funeral in my life, ever, where we put somebody in a box and went, here lies a rotten person. Right. Here lies a criminal. Here lies a guy who on August 31st of 1976 did this. That's not, I mean, <laughs> you know I've what I mean? I've never been in one of those either. And so just that in and of itself, that we should lead all of the discussion around George Floyd about like who she thinks George Floyd was, is in and of it just odd, right? All right, well, beyond that, she says, all everything she just said about Dirk, Derek Chauvin. Only she did do that. After this, Candace Owens made a documentary, which I watched. And in the documentary, at least part of it, she tried to make the case that Derek Chauvin actually didn't kill George Floyd. Hmm. So she actually, even in that, even the small glimpse of, hey, now this is after there's been a trial and there's been a determination by medical examiners. Everybody can go get this for yourself. She always quotes quote Shelby Steele when she talks about the, uh, the intellectuals that, that she was inspired by. Eli Steele, the son of Shelby Steele, who made a documentary with his father, wrote an op-ed criticizing Candace Owens after that documentary came back. She went even too far for them. Mm-hmm. It doesn't stop there. Candace Owens said Juneteenth is ghetto and made up. What would be ghetto and made up? First of all, all of these different commemorations and holidays are made up. What would be ghetto and made up about celebrating the end of slavery? Really? If there's anything <laughs> that should be made up in America, anything that should be made up, we they should have been just sat around and went, you know what? Um, uh, March 3rd, we're going to celebrate the end of slavery. slavery. Everybody is off work. Everybody gets, boom, end of slavery, cool. The fact that we actually continuously call slavery the worst portion of American history, but there is not a nationwide effort to commemorate the end of it. Wow, well, they want to forget about it. Right, <laughs> is the thing. And to call it ghetto is to say... It's a trigger word. It, it's, it's ghetto, it's for niggas, and it's made up, all right? Candace Owens did blame the right people for the death of Philando Castile. However, she said that it was an anomaly that should not be focused on. A lot of Black people looked at the death of Philando Castile. We looked at him as the perfect victim. Like, here's a guy that was reaching for, and the cops popped off on him. I could go on. What she said about Breonna Taylor. She's never, she never misses the opportunity never. to trigger us and be off code. The cops acted right in Breonna Taylor. That's what she said. They walked in, no knock warrant. Breonna Taylor's uh, boyfriend at the time doesn't know who it is. They fired, boom, 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 into the building, killed Breonna Taylor. Breonna Taylor's murdered. A oh, uh, uh, wanton disregard for life, wanton endangerment. Candace Owens doesn't have a problem with it. No. Doesn't have, a, doesn't have an issue with it. Let, let's have a with you with still contends and believes that the Central Park Five committed the actual crime that they were unfairly convicted for and then refuses. I have it right here. Look, right here. It's after doing the work. This officer Tatum said this in 2019. This is all in reaction to Ava DuVernay making When They See Us. It says, after doing the research, I agree uh, with Trump about the Central Park Five. These guys were not innocent little kids, but young men who admitted to multiple crimes, blah, 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 blah. Uh, and then Candace Owens comes back and says, this is exactly the problem. The, re the media relies on black emotion. Few people re read the details of the case. 
Now blacks are once again being emotionally, emotionally manipulated by less leftists. I agree with you wholeheartedly, Brandon. The Central Park Five were not innocent. I want everybody to understand that there was a confession in the case of the exonerated five, a confession in the case, and then they were an, exonerated by DNA when the guy who admitted to it, his DNA was found on the victim. Right. The left is not responsible for exonerating the exonerated five. The actual legal system is they got one right for a change after they coerced, bullied, and manipulated these young men into doing and saying something that they weren't involved in. When are you... I mean, I could go on, right? Like, it, like it's... You could go on. She testified in front of Congress that white supremacy and white nationalism are not a problem that's harming black America. It, Her words, quote. Well, well, I mean, look, so all my thing is this. If we want to have a conversation about Candace Owens, if we want to talk about Candace Owens, the capture of the right over black America is happening and it's going to be successful. I am completely sure that it's going to be successful. The rightward shift of black people right now in America cannot be stopped. I don't think it can be. And I don't think it can be because the people on that side, if they ever wanted to actually target black people, there's this weird, I don't even know how to articulate it. There's this weird pocket. Distrust of government makes sense for black people. Yeah. Distrust of medicine makes sense for black people. Distrust of media. Distrust of media makes sense for black people. All of these things make sense for black people. They all do. My daddy actually used to say, shit, I might consider voting for the Republicans if I didn't know that they hated niggas. He was like, when you look at my life, all of this, I might consider if I didn't know that they hated niggas. All of these other things that we deal with, the clinging to religion and all of that stuff, if you don't push her, if you don't litigate her and who she is and what she said, if you're not interested in doing that, the top part of her, like the, 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 the surface of it, is going to seem palatable. Exactly. Which is why, go right back to what we were saying at the beginning of this. I do not understand what they were doing. I don't understand why they allowed that to happen. And to me, they furthered her cause and the, black conserv and the black conservative cause. Yeah. They applauded her. I mean, Jess was like, yeah, 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 yeah. You, you know, it's great. Yeah, people get it wrong. Like, they, they literally were like a sounding board for her. They were a choir behind her. It doesn't matter that they were asking her questions. The questions that were being asked were for her to further explain what she believes. There was not one challenge in any of that. So, and if you, I believe exactly what you're saying about Black people being affected by conservatism and, and, the, and the right being able to have a hold on them. I believe Charlemagne knows that, which is why if, you, if that's not what you believe, then I don't understand why you allowed that to happen. I, I just, I, I don't think, I think it was, I, I don't think the purpose of ha having Candace, oh, how about this? That woman is dangerous. Just, just listen. I don't think the purpose of having Candace Owens on there was to litigate whether or not she was anti-black. And I don't see why. To me, that would be the first thing then that what you is, would want to... What's the breakfast club then? I mean, the, I think, to me, that would be the... That wasn't the purpose. The purpose, I think, for the breakfast club was just to have a conversation with Candace Owens, who is somebody that they say the, the 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 audience had been asking for to come on the show. Because they thought that they would be better with how they handled it. Right. You want a conversation with Candace Owens? Talk to her on her phone since you were bragging about having her number and she changed it. Like, talk to her, have that conversation with her off mic. People were begging for it because they had no idea that is the conversation that you would have with her. She is dangerous. I used to go back and forth with Candace Owens in the DM. But that, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying that yeah. there's anything wrong with that. What I'm saying is if all you wanted was a conversation, mm -hmm. then have that behind closed doors. People were asking for it because they thought that you would do better they, with that type of to conversation. Me, you cannot have a conversation with right. her, especially on a black platform, without litigating. Because we could talk about other stuff. We could talk about, you know, what she said about, it's like, there's, there's some small stuff. Like, 
like a small thing, two little small things that just jump out. She goes, play, play the clip about Trump real quick. Mm-hmm. But I thought it was weird when all of a sudden the people that liked Trump, you know, everyone thought he was like this iconic symbol, symbol of business. He was in rap songs. Every, you know, Trump was the status flipped on him in one second. I just didn't I didn't buy the narrative mm-hmm. that he was in the media for three, four decades. And suddenly you wanted me to believe overnight that he was like Adolf Hitler and a mm-hmm. racist. Mm-hmm. So I just didn't trust the media's narrative about him. And so I decided to actually listen to what he. OK, so cut it right there. That's like two minutes into the interview. Yes. Okay. That's like not. That's just not true. So let just just real quick. I'll give you guys an example of something real quick. So, I'm sure there were people that weren't paying attention to Donald Trump until he decided to run for president. But there are two things that happened there. One is that way before Donald Trump start decided to run for president, he started pushing the birther lie. This is like 2011. Yeah. So the rightward shift. You guys don't remember this? Donald Trump offering money for Barack Obama's birth certificate, Donald Trump going back and forth with Rosie O'Donnell because of all of these different things, Donald Trump's rightward shift, his rightward shift into some sort of stalwart of the right, the far right, began way before then. It's not true that Donald Trump just decided to run for president and then everybody went, we hate Donald Trump. That's not true. Donald Trump started campaigning. Donald Donald Trump started talking. The rapists and murderers things. People got uh, uh, an image of who Donald Trump was when he was running and they were like we don't like this but when you say something like that it goes the media is fake and false and as soon as Donald Trump started running for president everybody flipped up on him that makes people go I had a conversation on my IG with my homie Graham and he just goes why does everybody want to come to try to come get Donald Trump that makes me think that Maybe they're trying to take him out because they don't want to hear what he has to say. I'm like, my nigga, did he fucking hide the documents or not? (laughs) My nigga, did he fuck with the shit in Georgia or not? Did he do it or not? So many people want to believe in conspiracy theories, and that's a whole nother issue. Listen, the the woman is dangerous. And if you don't believe that, and you don't believe what kind of impact she has, because I do believe that her message is never for Black people and never is, which is why it was funny that they allowed this conversation to happen and give her a Black quiz as if we can just joke around with her and it's all fun and games now with Candace Owens. Look at my comments on the post where I posted about Candace Owens being Black. Thousands and thousands of white people defending her, telling me how Black she is, telling me how factual she is, telling me about how she's a free thinker, how I am scared of her, how I am wrong, and she is right. Thousands. That's the kind of impact well, that look, Candace Owens has. All I'm saying is, to anyone that would platform or have a conversation with her, I'm not against platforming her. I'm not against having a conversation with I'm not. I'm I know. Not, I'm, not against, I'm not I'm not against but going back I'm not going to further her cause. I'm, I'm not. That's fine. I, we... we you, it's a it's a team thing here. So it's like whatever. But what I'm saying is, it's like if we had any white person on a a, a platform and they had said a small percentage of these things, exactly, we would talk about it and we would ask them about it. So they would be upset about it. Justin, you guys, you asked. Okay, I put up on social media. Want to talk about it? Put up on social media, what do you guys want to hear us talk about on Higher Learning? And so many people said, hey, they want to hear from Justin Sylvester because we've been teasing about you coming on this podcast. Justin Sylvester, if you don't know, where have you been? He is the host of E! News. You can catch him once, twice, co-hosting, whatever, doing all the things on Hoda and Jenna. Um, He's been on Broadway these days? Then what is it that he does? Twi- excuse me, twice? Twice. Jesus twice? Christ. Twice. W- there is nothing that this man cannot do. He is my friend. And I'm so ex- excited to have him on the podcast, Justin Sylvester. Oh my God. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm just so happy that a blackity black podcast finally had me on. Okay, now, mm. you know who you sounded like just for a second there. We, we, we were just having this conversation. Don't do that. Candace though. Owens. <laughs> Don't do that. To he him. said it. He said it. Don't do that. Don't do that to him. Yeah, don't do that to him. By the way, he, he, don't do that. he goes, wait, I, go ahead, defend it. I've been listening. Like, I have been trying to figure out why everybody's going so soft on her. Like, I am dying over here. Okay. I'm dying because I finally thought, oh, let me, you know, hear her out. Let me go ahead. You know, Charlemagne's always so hard. Joe Budden's always so hard. Just with the mess is always so hard. 
everybody took it easy on her. And I, I, it was, it was strange to me, but I don't know. There's some things I can say about this, but we need more than an hour. Yes, we will not put you, we will not put you on the spot. And no, I would never be friends with anybody who was anything similar to Candace Owens, but I'm happy to have you on a Blackity Black podcast. As you said, Justin, um, where do I even start? Okay, so Van, I'm happy to have you here to help me out. Now, Van always is on to me about the fact that I, yeah, don't make a face. Okay, date well, outside your race? Thank you. That I date outside my race. He loves to make jokes. He loves okay. to poke fun about it. It's not that. Yeah. It's not It's not that she dated outside of her race. It's okay, like, married. Married is the thing. Oh, oh shit. You have an issue? Let no, me all... Whoa, whoa, wait, whoa, whoa, wait. Whoa, Excuse whoa, me, Justin. Whoa. We got some family business, sweetie. Hold on, hold on. Whoa, let me get Dr. Phil all, on the all, line. Let me just... Hold on. Let, let, me just, let me just go on record right now. Number one, I don't care. It's just funny. <laughs> okay, I, I I don't care. It's just funny. It's a funny thing to poke fun at somebody about. It's just it's just a funny sure. thing. There are parts of it. I mean, there, it can be corrosive, like not in Rachel's case, but in other cases when people use their preference to minimize somebody else. Obviously, it could be corrosive, but it's just a funny thing. Everybody thinks I have a problem with it. It's just a funny thing to make fun of somebody about. Yeah, and the it's it's. We've had more conversations about it in regards to it's okay when white uh, black women do it versus when black men do it. Yeah. Why do black women date outside of their race? Why do black men date outside of their race? Why are, do we typically see successful or famous black men date outside of their race? Um, and then it led us to a conversation we were having about Gerard Jared Carmichael, Carmichael, which I yeah. just watched Rothaniel. I know I'm late. I just watched that on the plane. He's a brilliant guy. Absolutely incredible. Like I'm a huge fan, and I can't wait yeah. to start watching his reality a show. Guy. But we were I talking actually about heard the, the conversation. Actually, I'm gonna, oh, you before did. we even start the conversation, I want to say to Van, thank you for questioning your allyship, because I find the best allies are the ones who question if they could be doing more. Mm. Um, when someone says out loud, I know I'm an ally, but I could be doing more. And I don't know, to me, that's very powerful because it then makes other people, it's like the flu shot. You hear somebody got the flu shot. You're like, should I get the flu shot? And the conversation oh. starts going and you don't even realize it with just at questioning yourself how big of an impact it makes. So thank you. Oh, wow. Appreciate that. Um, so what's your thoughts? Because look, this is the thing. I saw the Rothaniel thing. I, I've been following Jared's, uh, Gerard's career for a long time. And it's very powerful, him stepping into himself I and so his too. identity and all of that stuff. But when I saw his boyfriend, I was like, you know, I know a lot of black gay fellas. And a lot of them that I know, they're with white guys. And it seems to be, maybe it's, maybe this is, anecdotal, but it seems to be a trend. It's, there seems to be a thing there. Is, am, am I, is there yeah, a thing first there? off, is, there a tr is that a thing? Is that a thing? Yeah. N no, I think what you're seeing, first of all, I'm speaking from my own experience. I'm uh -huh. speaking from my own therapy. I'm seeking, speaking from my own work on myself and on relationships and on how I view things. I'm also on the record going to tell you that I'm an equal opportunity dater. Okay. okay, that's right. I will go from black, blackity black, all the way to white, like Paisley. Okay, I'm all over the place. Brazilians, <laughs> Argentinians, I have right. been all over the spectrum. Just now, don't put yourself out there like that. <laughs> no, I'm just letting you guys know. I, I'm I'm here for it. What I will say is, I think there are a few reasons why you see it, and you recognize it more prevalently. Um, I think one, for myself, growing up when I was slowly starting to figure out who I was and, you know, come into terms with being gay, I think a lot of the people who kind of tormented me on a daily basis were young Black guys. Um, and I found refuge in women. And that's why you see a lot of gay, straight women alliances, because when you're going through figuring out who you are, who you like, who you love, a lot of times your peers are the ones that, you know, drug you through the dirt for who you were. Um, even the guys that you experimented with denied even knowing you when you walked out. So, mm. you know, looking at some of my uncles who said, you know, some very off-color things, 
not even knowing that the bigotry behind them or that they were saying it to somebody who was hiding that secret here. A lot of times I didn't think I could ever get love from a Black man until I got older. Because, you know, the love that I was supposed to get from my friends and from my dad or from my uncles or from anyone, the people around me, it just wasn't there. Um, so a lot of times you have to go through this journey of not only finding love with other Black men, but also finding love within yourself because, you know, you were told at church, you were told at school, you were told in social settings that you weren't worthy and that you were shit and, you know, you were F, F this and, you know, you don't even realize how much rebuilding you have to do as a gay man. I think another thing that kind of sort of happens, and you notice it a lot in Hollywood, when I got to a bigger city and realized that people are freer and they're dating and they are experimenting and, and this free love thing kind of happened to me in West Hollywood and people were dating outside of their race, you're like, oh my God, this is phenomenal. So you're just being exposed to other cultures and other people. And a lot of times people don't even realize that they are only clocking you when you're dating a white guy. Because nobody mm. would be like, oh, he's dating a Brazilian guy. You know what I mean? Right. Or no, oh, Don Lemon's with, 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 with an Asian guy. Like nobody would really clock that. I think you only are clocking the black man, white men thing. Mm. Um, so you're noticing it as much because of your trauma as you are anything else. Like it, it jumps out at you because of the way you view interracial relationships. It's not as prevalent as you might be making it, but you notice it more because you're like, oh my God, that feels weird. I think, I think you notice it more because you, you know, right, were conditioned me. to, yeah, yeah. I yeah. think people, I mean, listen, I had a situation where I dated a white man who left me for a white man. And all I could think about was he left me for a white man. Meanwhile, <laughs> he's a white man. Like, you know, right. we were just conditioned growing up that interracial relationships weren't worthy and weren't seen as okay. Like, I mean, I can remember being a kid and, you know, my older sister having a, a guy friend who was white and the, 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 the kind of, you know, the ragging that she got for having a white guy friend that wasn't even her boyfriend at the time scarred me for life. Like, I was like, oh, I can mm. never date outside my race in my town because this is what my sister got. Um, and it happens a lot. And we don't even realize how much pressure it adds to kids, to children going through and trying to figure their, their stuff out. But that's a you thing. That's a problem that you have. I don't have that problem. I can date outside my race. I can appreciate people who date outside their race. I have, mm -hmm. I don't have that issue. That just might be a you thing. Mm. You know, when you when you look at Black straight men who date outside of their race, a lot of times Black women who have an issue with it is because you have these Black men who are like, I'm never dating a Black woman. Like, this is all that I want. And they feel like that's something that they deserve or they feel it's a prize. Or maybe, we touched about this on the podcast, they feel like they've gone through trauma with Black women. And so, which I don't believe that part. But I mean, that's what they say. That's what they say. But I am wondering, is there any correlation with that when it comes to Black gay men dating white men? Because that's, yeah. do, you, do you get, oh, go ahead. No, I think there's a, definitely a correlation. A lot of my experiences with Black men, the reason why they end is because, like I, for instance, I have an ex who's 53 years old, on paper, bomb successful, makes a killing, has homes in multiple places, is super smart, went to Harvard. We have a great connection. Um, but he's waiting until his mother passes, until he can live his life fully. Um, so you have a lot of Shit. gay men who you are, Black gay men who are still kind of sort of in the closet or not fully out. And a, a lot of times as an out-out gay man, as myself, as, you know, Gerard Carmichael, or as someone who is on TV who represents and says, I am a gay Black man, you know, sometimes other Black men don't really want to end up on that Insta. They don't really want to end up in the public eye because they're still you know, kind of, sort of, in that closet. A lot of gay Black men are in the closet. Mm. Still. So, and not, like, fully in the closet. Like, you'll meet a Black gay man who's, you know, about it, and then you get to know him a little bit better, and, oh, you know, 
I can't really put you on this because, or I can't really bring you to this because I'm not that out at work or I'm not, everyone has that degree of, of something. Mm -hmm. So I think for, you know, people who are out in public, like that's something that you have to keep in mind. I also, for myself, I like to date guys because everybody has baggage. I personally Mm -hmm. can't date someone with the same baggage as me especially somebody who's not on the same level of collecting their baggage. Because a lot of times you do all this work on yourself and growing up in the South as a Black gay man, first of all, you have to deal with the Black thing. Then you have to deal with the gay thing. You know, meeting someone who has the same baggage and they're not on the same level of getting to accepting themselves, they can drag you back to step three when you're on step seven. Yeah. Mm. And not that I don't want to go to step three with you at all. I, it's just a very hard, it's a very, it reignites a trauma that it took so long for you to, you know, get rid of, to, to mm. heal from. Um, so I think when you talk about trauma and dating within your race, again, it's not a bad thing. Everybody has trauma. I personally like to date all races, and that's probably one of the reasons why it's a little bit, you know, a little bit tougher. So it's interesting because I want to ask two questions. One of them is about what you just said, which is a a more general question because it's uh, very moving to hear you uh, talk and express yourself about this. And it makes you think about like how somebody actually has to live their life. Um, It's just very moving. But what you just said a second ago is essentially... When I, when I was on the podcast, I said in an, in, an, in an artful way, a lot of the black men that I would meet out here that would be like, yo, because if I see you with three white girls in a row, I go, yo, man, what's up with you? <laughs> yeah. I mean, not in a bad way. I just go, what's the deal? And then they'll go, well, you know what, bro? I come from Baltimore. I come from Richmond. I come from New Orleans. I come from whatever, and like all the same stuff, all the same trauma and all of the same stuff that you go through, like these girls don't have this. These girls don't go through this. These girls don't deal with this. And then I would say that and I would be like, God damn. And I said that on the podcast and it it offended Rachel and it offended a lot of other people that listened. But it seems as if for different reasons, you're almost saying the same thing. You know, I think it's a I think it's a little bit different. Okay. I think that, you know, when you look at when you understand gay trauma and you understand, you know, systematic, you know, this is a systematic thing. Okay. Gay trauma is systematic. Everyone deals with the same trauma like clockwork, no matter where you're from. But I think when you are you know, growing up in smaller neighborhoods or, you know, in areas that have, you know, very little exposure, it's a lot more condensed. I think a lot of times when I say gay trauma, I'm talking about, you know, things that are every gay man. When you talk about sometimes, you know, the thing that you're talking about with straight men, sometimes it could be seen as an excuse. But again, who are we to tell people who they should, can, and and should love. That's not our place. That's not who we are. Because let me t- say something to you. If you saw a white man with three black women in a row, and that white man's family said, "Hey, bro, what you doing? I saw you with three black women. What you, like what's going on?" You would be like, "Whoa, whoa, 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 bro! You can't like your family can't say that." So we yeah. have to be super careful with checking people about dating outside their race, because if the tables were turned and we had heard white people say that our Asian people are even like, you know, Brazilian people saying you can't date X, Y, and Z because of the color of their skin, we would, we'd be pissed. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think the table has a different weight, but I, but I, but I, I take your point. I want to ask you about something. Just how much of your life is muted and strained because of how society perceives you. Like, thinking about somebody that is, it's like deeply, deeply saddening sometimes when you sit in this. Thinking about somebody who wants to either, like, wait till their mom passes away, 
so that they can experience love or it's fucked up. Yeah. I don't no, really know wild. what I'm trying to ask you. Yeah. Let me tell you something. Gerard Carmichael showing his mother praying the gay away to, for him and in front of him is something that a lot of people deal with. And, you know, people say, I can't believe he showed her like that. I can't believe he showed her like that. And I praise him for showing that because a lot of times, you know, we think that, oh, we live in California. Oh, we live in New York. Like, yeah. it's cool to be gay. It's No, it's popping for you guys. You guys are killing it. You own talent agencies. Neil Patrick Harris is here. Don Lemon is doing the damn thing on CNN. But for people in those flyover states and in some parts of these big cities, that's not the case. They're still living like Jared Carmichael's living. And I will mm. say this wholeheartedly. When I go home to Louisiana, I have a hard time doing it. And I go less and less because I feel like I fully can't be myself in front of my family. And that's a, that's a, that's a thing I think a lot of people deal with. I think a lot of times you go home, you have to butch it up. You go home, you have to like pretend like you're someone that you're not. And as a 37-year-old man, I used to go home four times a, um, a year because I felt like I had to. Now at 37, I'm like once a year and I'm good. And that's a 36-hour hit because I have to stifle who I am. I can't shine as bright as I want to because I know there are people who are still not fully comfortable with that. Wow. And, yeah. you know, it's crazy. It's, it's a wild thing to really think about that we're Justin. doing this in 2024. <clears throat> Justin, I love that you came on this podcast and I love that you're being so vulnerable with us. I mean, we have these conversations every day. All the time. <laughs> or just, we talk every day. But I love that our audience is getting to hear from you and they've asked for you and they've really just asked for representation, period, to come on this podcast. And you're saying so many things that are resonating with us and I know that will with other people. What you have, you've mentioned that you've done the work on yourself that, you know, you may have started off on this level and you're at this level now. For anybody listening, like, what is it that they can do? They may be struggling. They may feel like they can't go home. I mean, hearing you say you can't go home and be yourself is just, it's like, it's devastating. What, what are some tools, tips, what helped you get to where you are now and that keep you going? Because I'm sure it's a struggle every day. Oh, one, build a home for yourself. And when I say that, I mean, build a safe place where you can be yourself, you can, you know, express yourself. And I, when I say home, I mean a group of friends, a work environment where you feel loved. Find people who see you for who you are and make that your home. Because a lot of times you feel lost because you don't have somewhere to come back to. So that's the first thing. The second thing is when you're working on yourself, you have to get to that place of self-love because for years, from 14 to 23, I lived in Louisiana and I always thought I wasn't worthy because that's what people told me. Because let me tell you something, it's the white man, it's the white lady, it's the black man, it's the black woman in Louisiana. And then all the way at the bottom is the gay black man we don't talk about because we are Catholic. And, you know, we don't, we don't deal with that. We just don't deal with the gay black man. We all had uncles who were gay that, you know, we weren't told or talked about, you know, who they were. We just said, oh, that's Uncle Dave. And he didn't really talk to anyone. And he lived in a big city and he never came home. And, you know, mm -hmm. we, really, we really don't do that. But I think for yourself, building yourself back up and telling yourself that you're worthy and you're worthy of love is really important on a daily basis, on a daily, daily basis. And I think the third thing that you can do is, I heard someone say this the other, like a few years ago and it stuck with me. You have to meet people where they are. You mm -hmm. have to meet people where they are. And, you know, I feel like in my life, I met people who didn't really understand what gay meant. They didn't know how to talk about it. They didn't know how to express it. They didn't know how to talk to you about it. And I think a lot of times people are afraid to talk about what they don't know. So a lot of times your parents will look at you and you will have like a 
purple boa on with high heels and they will act like they don't know what's up. Although they know that you're playing with Barbie dolls in the closet, they just don't talk about it. And once you realize like for myself, like my mom just didn't have the tools to deal with a gay son. And a lot of things went unspoken and a lot of things went unsaid. And I had to forgive her where she was because of that. Mm. And the minute you let that part go, the minute you look at someone and you say, oh, you didn't ignore this because it was inconvenient. You didn't ignore this because you were ashamed of me. You ignored this because there was some shame within yourself that you had the gay son and that you didn't know how to talk about it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to let you have that and I'm going to figure out a way to talk to you where you yeah. are and not be upset about what I didn't get. Hmm. Does that make sense? It does. Absolutely. Last question for sense. me. Last question for me. What do I have to do to be a part of the chicken niggas crew, bro? What like what? what like what like what what? He look, literally will text me this. Let, let me tell you guys something. Let me tell you guys something. Rachel could give a fuck about LSU football. She could literally could give a shit about it. Like she she really could give a I I literally grew up. Like you could hear the stadium from where from where I grew up. I went to McKinley, whole nine from Baton Rouge. Justin is in with the most powerful chicken family in the world currently. <laughs> like he, he is the, the the most. I'm not even going to go into everybody's business. The most power, and they got they got more pool in Baton Rouge than anyone. And every time Rachel hit me, Rachel would be like, "Yeah," and by, not just Rachel, a lot of other people. Joy Taylor, Joy Taylor went to Baton Rouge. Was hanging out. Was like, yeah, I'm here with X and X and blankety blank, and I went here. I'm like, hey, could you maybe <laughs> introduce me to them? Or <laughs> I met the dude at Jimmy's house. Is there any way that I could get in with the chicken niggas? <laughs> and, and and Joy was like, yeah, I hit him up. Told him, I was like, you know what? Fuck it. I don't want to be with the chicken niggas no more. <laughs> and then I started. And then I started this tirade. But really, it's out of jealousy, envy, and hurt, Justin. That's what it's really out of. I don't want to be that way anymore. And once you're in, you're in. And they're great. They are <laughs> ugly people. Oh, you're I rubbing it in. Anybody. I'm rubbing it in. I am rubbing it are in. Are you going to let him in? <laughs> you know I, what? Like, I'm bro, right. I might. I might. Because I personally have been listening to this podcast for a while. And the conversations you guys had around, you know, Gerard Carmichael and this, you know, specific topic is, I have to say, I was truly impressed with you, even the parts where you question yourself. And again, that's kind of sort of the most important, you know, because checking yourself in front of people is kind of the greatest thing that you could do. And I had this conversation with somebody during, you know, when, when it was gay rights and we were having the issues and then women's rights came about and then black rights movement came about again. And I always told people, whether they were black, whether they were white, whether they were men or women or what side they were on, keep checking yourself. Mm -hmm. As long as you're checking yourself and you're checking yourself in front of people, like, it doesn't matter. If you say, you know, I don't know what this George Floyd thing is about, but I'm trying to learn and I know I need to be better. I will sit with you for 35 minutes. We will have a cocktail mm -hmm. and I'm going to tell yeah. you exactly what's going on because I know where your heart is and I know where your mind is. And I do the same thing with myself. When women's rights came, you know, into question, I had to check myself on a lot of things because I had been in my own world. But again, checking yourself and ch checking yourself in front of people will often create conversations that you didn't even know you started. So you can come with the Jigga Diggas because you've been checking yourself on this podcast. Hey! <laughs> I will Thank you, get you guys. In. I will get you in with the chickens. He really I will. Thank you. You're in. in. I love it. I love it. I can't wait. <laughs> I had that shit on Sunday. <laughs> all right. Oh, <laughs> like, hold on. I drove oh, all the before way Before we go, before we go, before we go, I have to ask you one question before I leave. Sure. Have you ever dated outside your race? Yeah. Wait, dated? Yeah, I mean, or yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, okay. So we didn't talk about. We never talked about that. How many times? I mean, <laughs> like not. When, when we when we talking about dating. We're talking about a more casual type of thing. But you know more casual type of thing. Louisiana you, or California? Louisiana. And how guilty did you feel dating outside your race? Once it became a thing, it was like, well, a, a couple of times in California too, but once it became a thing, once, like I had somebody, 
because I was in a conversation with somebody one time and they went, hey, it's good to see that you your horizons is broadened because, like, you know, I know that you'd be talking a lot of the black shit that you'd be talking because I was hanging out with y'all, but I see you here and then I'll have to, like, check myself. But, like, like everybody's been with somebody of a different race. That's not true. No? I mean, you know, I had a guy on my season who had never been with anything but white. No, there, and he there was are black. a lot of people yeah. who have never, there are yeah. a lot of people who have never been outside their race because of the fear and pressure from nah, their I taste race. It. I, taste it. I tasted the vanilla. I tasted it. Well, I think, well, I was about to say something about black men. I was about to say something about black men. I've tasted the vanilla. I've tasted All right, okay. I've tasted the vanilla. I've tasted the custard. I've tasted all the different, I've tasted, yeah, it's been a whole, I, I'm, I'm not unrepresented in any of the areas. <laughs> like, I'm not, Look, every part cousin. of the globe. <laughs> I got a cousin who's sleeping, I'm telling you, she literally, I'm calling her out, in her 40s, you know, is sleeping on someone who I think is great for her and amazing for her, but, you know, she is still in this mindset at 47 that she can't date outside her race, even though this man that she has met and has been dealing with for years has been patient with her and and trying to figure out how to make this work because he sees what everyone else sees. But she has been conditioned for years and years and years to think that she can't date mm. outside her race. And by the way, I'm not saying anything about men who think or women who strictly date inside their race. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I'm here for it. I just think when it comes to you and life hands you something that doesn't look the way you thought it was going to be wrapped, you got to give it a shot no matter what anyone else says. Mm -hmm. I tried. <laughs> All right, Justin. <laughs> <laughs> I'm You're like, Amy Winehouse. Right. Amy right, well. Winehouse. You're going back to black. <laughs> <laughs> Justin, we really appreciate you, brother. Yes, thank Seriously, you so much. Man. Catch him on E News e -news. Weekly and Hoda and Jenna and everywhere else. Bye, Justin. Bye. <laughs> okay, guys, there is something happening right now in black culture that must be discussed. It is something that had a lot of people on pins and needles <laughs> because there is a time in our culture that is being revisited right now on Hulu. And that's the time of freak, Nick. The era of the freak, the era of the Nick. The documentary is on Hulu right now. And one of the creators of this is a gentleman that I've known for years who I am so happy that he is getting his just due for all of the contributions that he has made inside of this culture. I'm talking about P. Frank Williams, who goes from the Source magazine. He, he, he produced stuff at when I was working at TMZ. He was producing the show there. I worked with him on Hip Hop Homicides. I was with him every single day. He made me a better host. And now this thing that he's created, the Freak Nick documentary, is scaring the shit out of aunties, pastors, attorneys, Everyone who doesn't want people to know where they were in 1996. Everyone's talking about it culturally. I want to talk about it with P. Frank. Thank you for joining us today. We want to talk about it on Higher Learning. P. Frank, how are you? My brother, thank you. That felt like a sports uh, introduction there. Like, a, hey, it was a play-by-play. -play. But no, man, uh, thank you, my brother. Congratulations. I'm proud of all the things that you do for the culture. Um, Freak Nick exploded. This documentary I had no idea that everybody was going to be so up in arms about it, but um, I think that people were thinking that the auntie or the uncle was going to be shamed, but I think everybody was 21 or uh, 20 years old at one point. Your mom and her friends, how do you think that you got here? You got here because she was at the church praying? <laughs> so, I yes. mean, you know, Freak Nick is about <laughs> black joy. It was a time, the time capsule, right? It was a time when you could, imagine right now, Van, uh, you could go out in Atlanta or even Louisiana, Baton Rouge, where you're from, 300,000 people was on the streets having mm. a good time on the freeway and nobody was shooting at each other. And it was lit like that. And that cute girl you're trying to get a number from, the cute girl with the green pants and the little, you know, whatever number you wrote down, that was that time mm. before cell phones and all of the DMN and, you know, word of mouth. But th that's exactly the point, P. Frank, because I would think... I'm surprised that you didn't think people would be shocked by this coming out, particularly the people who might be recognized because you're right. Back then, there were no cell phones. It was just the big camcorders and not everybody had them. There was no social media. So you felt more free 
to be free than you do now, per se, <laughs> knowing that it could last forever on the internet or be captured in someone's phone. Um, right. So I guess for me, I wonder, was there, were y'all nervous at all about the pushback that you received? Because there was a time where people were, you know, threatening lawsuits or, you know, putting out letters, saying they were going to have letters, certain letters or whatever to you guys, a cease and desist. How did you guys handle that? Well, first of all, let me just say something as a, a point of education. If you walk outside right now in your little skimpy underwear and start running down the middle of the street, anybody can put that on TV. When you're on the street publicly anywhere in the whole world, this is from lawyers, it's not from me. There is no coverage. If you go back inside your house and then you do that, then obviously I can't put it on TV. But it's all free game if you're running around. So I wasn't here to shame anybody. If you watch the film, there's no like negative sort of things that people were doing, but people was having a good time. The girls were dancing, time. guys were getting in, you know. I don't know. I think I think it's I think it's unfortunate that people thought it was a negative thing to be having fun, right? Once it's promiscuous or it gets offensive or people are sexually assaulting people, that's out of bounds. But to have a good time, party in the street, drinking with your friends. If you've been to Bayou Classic, anything like that, it's the same thing, but on 12. Right. Freak Nick, the wildest story never told. It's on Hulu right now. Everybody go check it out. Huge, huge first weekend. Why was the story important to tell? Well, no, I think that we need these moments of black joy. You know, the show and I, you and I did Hip Hop Homicide together. That was a little bit more on the darker side. You know, yeah. unfortunately, some of the things that happen in our culture, we need to document that as well. But this was about Black Joy. Last year was the 40th anniversary of Freaknik. You know, and by the way, Freaknik didn't start as like a big tailgate. It was with some young kids in a college environment, if you've seen the film, who started out very innocent. It was unfortunately later on with some of your cousins and uncles and all of them who ain't never been to a college campus started showing up because there was pretty girls. But, you know, I thought that it was important to showcase this moment in time. And I know that, you know, millennials like yourself or Gen Z, they're fascinated by what we did in the 90s. And so, you know, Rihanna, Drake, 21 Savage, everybody's like, well, why did you put 21 Savage? Why is executive producer? You know, the internet, y'all just start going crazy. Um, <laughs> two reasons. You know, 21 had multiple freak nickname parties, and I'm here to make money. I wanted to market to a younger generation, so I put one of their stars as executive producer. That's yeah. it. And so, I mean, that's the reality of what it is. I know people are like, well, how is 21 on here? But it was, you know, all intentional. And so I'm, I'm happy. It's a celebration. This is a film about Black joy and about Black fun. There were some dark moments, but that's ultimately what it was. Yeah, I didn't feel that way about 21 Savage until I watched the documentary. And there was this gatekeeping by people who went to Freaknik, who experienced it, who lived through it. And then I was like, okay, well then why is 21 Savage a part of this if you feel a certain way about people who weren't in Atlanta at the time, weren't born when it happened. So can you talk a little bit about bringing in 21 Savage, I guess, compared to those, to what people were saying? Because Black Twitter really was well, no, going off I mean, that. you know, and as Bando, I work in a business that's about, you know, making sure that people watch. And so this is a multi-generational story. So I wanted to get my kids who are twins, 19 years old. They know 21. They may not know Luke as much. And, you know, 21, again, like I said, did have multiple uh, Freaknik theme parties. And to be transparent, I started the film off with 21 intentionally to bring in a new audience to say, hey, look at this, what happened. Let me show you what it was. And so it was, you know, it was on purpose, to be honest. And, you know, I can deal with the hate that people are like, well, why is that? You know, but when you tell a story, there's multiple layers of it, right? People who are in it, people who admire it, all of those different kind of things. So 21 represented a generation looking back um, at what we did in the 90s. That actually is good for the documentary. I'll tell you why. Shout out to Prentice Penny, Culture House Media, and um, Onyx Hulu. I was a part of the Black Twitter documentary. I was in the documentary, and then I hosted it, excuse me, the Q&A after we premiered at South by Southwest. And immediately when it came out, Black Twitter ignited. Why are these people in it? Why is this person doing it? Why this? Why that? You want that. You got to have that. It's the way that we litigate things by going back and forth. Uh, 21 Savage and all of that is actually good for it. So that was actually a, a smart move. Was there any trepidation? Because I watched it and I was thoroughly, thoroughly entertained. Number one, it is in extremely informational. Like extremely informational. I come at the end of this. So I get to college in 98. And so Kappa Beach Party is more my thing. 
We're going to Galveston. We're doing all of this. These these offshoots of it. Daytona was one. All of this kind of stuff like this. Um, but to figure out how Freaknik began, why Freaknik became such a big thing, how Freaknik changed, and the one rapper that did more to change Freaknik than anybody else, it was hysterical. There was a lot there to actually learn about this thing that exists in this very specific cultural space in Black America. There's also some seriousness in the documentary about how things went on then and looking at them through the lens of today. Was there any trepidation on your part about looking at Freaknik, 1995, 1994, 1996, through a 2024 lens that people might either misconstrue or have negative feelings about what went on then? Well, you know, obviously we're friends and, you know, the truth is the truth, right? That The only way through is through, meaning there was a lot to unpack with Freaknik that wasn't about jumping on a Suzuki Samurai or having a turn up. You know, it was about the politics of that. The city of Atlanta didn't really know what to do with all these young black people. The Olympics were coming, the rise of outcasts, black sexuality, the rise of Atlanta as the black cultural capital of America. So I'm saying, I, I gave you the candy and the vegetables, meaning... You wanted the candy, which was to turn up to see if your auntie and everybody was there. But there are a lot of vegetables that you need because that's what you really need. It's not the candy, but the vegetables. So I wanted to unpack the good and the bad. You know, and I think that sometimes in our community, Van, you know this, we don't want to look at the negative stuff. It's like, you know, we don't want to go inside the house and say, hey, some of these brothers was out of control. Some of them was inappropriate. Some of them was raping girls. Some of them was lewd. But there was also beautiful black times where people met their partner, people and their friends. They packed up in a Toyota Camry with $200 and they slept on a, in a U-Haul to go enjoy themselves. So that's what I wanted to do. I, I couldn't, I really wasn't so much concerned about today's world. I wanted to show you what happened in those 15, 20 years of Freaknik. So you got the whole gamut. And so, you know, I appreciate you saying it was informative because, you know, I felt like I had to make sure that you got all of it in the real way. And, edu- you know, I do edutainment as, as well as you do. So I educate and I entertain. And so the point of the Freaknik documentary was just that to educate you and entertain you. Mm. Yeah, I thought I I had no idea how much the 96 Olympics impacted how they treated freak, freak Nick. I had no idea that Outkast got their breakthrough um, you know, by pushing their music through through Freak Nick. That was really interesting and um Black Twitter speaking of that and um how they litigate things, a lot of people thought it was going to be a freakier documentary than it was. I'm wondering was that was there more maybe in the beginning or the developmental stages that you were going to put more of that footage in there? And then with the response of people knowing that this was going to come out, that maybe you felt like you had to water it down or, or dial it back? Or was the intention always to be exactly what we got? Well, no. I mean, obviously, everybody was looking for something a little bit more lewd. But I mean, you got to you got to peep game. You know, this is Disney and Hulu. I, I got Mickey the mouse, you know, there's you know, <laughs> <laughs> peep, peep game, you know, it's just not on HBO or something that's a little bit more raw. But no, I think I, I just, I wanted something tasteful and classy at the same time. You know, I gave you enough ratchetness, but I had to also give you some entertainment, but also give you some education. So I did not mean to water it down and do nothing like that. I wanted to tell the real story. Everybody's asking me for the director's cut. There are a lot of footage that I did not put in there, which involves sex in public, sex in the back mm-hmm. of U-Hauls, people, girls nude, strippers, all the kind of things that I know you and your friends was really looking for me to put on there, so but you know, I didn't have a mature <laughs> rating to, to deal with. So I want to make sure we're clear that I, I was being on, intentional, that I couldn't, you know, I couldn't go too far. Again, like I said, I did work for Disney on this project. P. Frank. Don't, Van. What, just Van. real quick. Van. Just real quick. <laughs> P. Frank, you know, I've been out to the office before and you know I don't like to work for free, but what I'll do is I'll come by the office and then <laughs> you and I can go through that footage and then we can decide if there is going to be a director's cut or something like that. I'll I'll help you. I don't even Thank want you. a credit, okay? And I don't, okay. Want, I don't need to get paid. Uh, okay. We're friends. I've known each other. We're, we're like a brother. I'll help you with that part of it, P. Frank. 
right. I thank you for your charity, man. If thank that's you. admirable. I yeah, I'll, I'll come out there. I'll come out there. We'll 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 go through it together. Together we can do okay. this. All right. Yeah, I mean, whatever it takes to get it there, my brother. Exactly. <laughs> Question. Okay. When you look at the stories that are being told now, P uh not P Frank, uh, uh, uh Freak Nick, Black Twitter, things like that. These are cultural phenomena that exist inside of Black America. Like, these are sort of our inside jokes, things that we're talking about. There's pushback from people sometimes about talking about those inside jokes on a Hulu or on a different place with telling those stories. I personally believe that there are stories to tell, so as long as we're telling them, it's okay. Do you hear the criticism that maybe we don't want America to know about Freak Nick? Do you hear the criticism that maybe we don't want America to know about Black Twitter? We don't want to teach them how to play spades. We don't want to do all of that stuff. Do you hear that, and do you think there's any merit to it? Well, no. I mean, anything Black is cool, right? And so, I mean, I think you got to realize that whatever we do is Black. And, and again, this Freak Nick documentary became really popular and Unblast has done really well, but that means that white people are watching it, right? That means that it's not just, it's like hip-hop. The only reason hip-hop got so big was because white kids started watching it. And so I think it's my job, your job, you know, your folks at Higher Learning to take the mores, the cultural parts of Black society and bring them out to the world. Why are we afraid to tell our truths? It's, 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 it's a trip how we still have this sort of, I don't want to tell the white man too much. Are we afraid like, oh my God, they, gonna, they know we was having a good time over playing some spades and on the, in the internet so I, I think that that's a horrible thing to think. I think our stories are the best stories out there. That's why they emulate us and want to be us because of our music, because of our, cult our culture, because of our sports, because of Freak Nick. Yeah, I can't even tell you. I was walking in an airport. I was doing a press thing and I had the, the Freak Nick poster, right? And do you know how many white people came up to me? Oh my God, I was watching that and that was the Freak Nick. Freaking freak. You know, I was like, well, damn. <laughs> that just goes to show you that that permeated to something that wasn't just us. And I think that's okay if people like myself or you are the people telling those stories because we're not watering it down. We're telling it from inside the culture to back out. It becomes a problem, in my opinion, when the people who are co-opting us tell it from the outside in. Mm -hmm. So that's my goal is to always tell our stories and I'm not going to sugarcoat it or whatever else. And there's 50 million of their stories. Why can't we tell like 10 or 12 of ours? Yeah. There you go. I want to go back to that, that gatekeeping question because we were talking about 21 Savage and... Um, how you wanted to bring in this new generation to see what Freak Nick was all about, people who didn't get to experience it. But at the end of that documentary, I was a little surprised to hear people like, like it ends with Kenny Burns being like, don't do it. Don't ever do it again. Don't don't copy it. Don't repeat it. And it did bring a lot of joy. Shout and it did Kenny. bring... Hmm? Shout out Kenny Burns. And it did bring a lot of people together. And I th thought it was cool that somebody tried to bring it back, which is also featured in the documentary. What were your thoughts about hearing some of the legends and people who were involved with uh, Freak Nick saying, don't, we don't want you to do it again? Well, no, I mean, obviously I put that up for debate. You know, my job as the producer and the director of this documentary, or even with Vans show, Hip Hop Homicides that I did, you know, I just turn the lens on things. I take a picture of it and like Polaroid, you know, you shake the Polaroid and I let you look at it, then that's your job to judge whether it's good or bad or whatever else. And so um, with the Freak Nick, I'm not sure that you can bring back that version of it where two or 300,000 kids are safe. Nobody's shooting each other. You're stepping on toes. The police harass them, but it ain't nothing crazy. Beating, shooting, killing people. So I'm saying that was a time capsule. And I think the debate of whether you could bring it back or not, is sort of futile. You can't go back to the past, right? It's like, it's like Nas in his first album. You can't do um, Illmatic again. He could do another album, but he can't do that. So for me, it was important to show that there's a lot of debate. And Carlos Neal, who's the guy who brought it back, he brought that back in a concert environment, right? In a safe place, a building with no, you know, you can security everything. 21's birthday, which I shot and put in the film, that was at um, uh, Five Points, the little underground mall there, and Control Security, Amazon sponsored it. It was only that street area at the underground. And so I'm saying, you can't bring back something because the times have changed too much, right? Our respect for each other as black people has changed. The amount of guns, the, the sort of rapiness has probably gotten worse. And so that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to show that Freaknik was a time capsule. And that was important to me to show that, you know? All right. We're going to let you get out of here, uh, P. Frank. But before you do, I, I have a, 
I have something that we can bring back. Okay, what's that? It's not Freak Nick. It's Woke Nick. <laughs> this is what my idea. Woke Nick. Woke Nick. It's all vegan. It's all positive. It's all community sponsored. It's abolition. You have stuff, to man. have dreads, <laughs> natural hair, and no, a septum no. ring to perform. No, so we, none of that shit. Woke bro. Nick shit, bro. is the future. Yes, I want to do no, Woke Nick no. in you, an area mm-mm. all recyclable. I want to get everybody like together. Like no. Woke Nick. Woke Nick. Woke Nick. Woke Nobody Nick. Be frank, will you do it with that. me? What? Nobody's going to watch that, man. Nope. I'm not, I don't have to. No. We, we want to make money, Woke man. Nick. No. Ask Aleo, your co-host. Ra- and Rachel, Ashley, do you want to go to Woke Nick? Rachel, will she you says no. I, I, I won't be there. Nobody's coming there. to Woke Nick. Van <laughs> Lathan presents Woke Nick. That's what I'm doing. That is if it woke Nick, that the wokest really party boring. ever told. No, Mm-mm. no, that's right, going to be as worth the time. It's a no for me. Yeah, you know what? That's fine. You know what? You don't want to do my. I'm gonna do it. It's gonna be me and Bozeman. Uh, P. Frank, <laughs> I'm happy that this happened for you, brother. I'm happy that uh, that your vision got out there. So happy to to know that you were a part of this. Always excited for your success. Thank you for joining us on Higher Learning. It's on Hulu right now. Freak Nick, uh, the wildest story never told. The wildest party never told. The wildest party never told. Keep saying story. The wildest party never told. Go out there, stream it right now. You will not regret it. It is a lot of fun and very, very, very infotainmental. Uh, yes. So check it out. Thank you, people. I love you making up words. Appreciate black people making up words. But I appreciate you, Van. Shout out to Higher Learning. Thank you, Rachel. Make sure you watch. I appreciate y'all. All right, brother. Peace, man. Thank you. Peace. All right, before we go, and we we, we got to get out of here. Before we go, all right, I want to say one thing real quick. If you guys don't know, Drake and Kendrick Lamar are into it. Kendrick Lamar is uh, and, and, and shot at Drake on the new Future and Metro Boomin album. New Future, new Future came out, and he shot at him. Right. Um. So it was interesting to me. Drake came out after this, and he, uh, I guess, he gave a motivational speech at a concert. Somebody called it a Martin Luther King speech. Could be. I've heard that Drake gives speeches like this at concerts all the time. All right, I have a little story about my dad. Gonna be quick with it. Story about my dad. So, I get put in the gifted program. Uh, we come to California, and uh, I'm 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 not making friends. You know, I'm big. I'm from Louisiana. I'm loud. I'm boisterous. Whatever. I, I, I'm, I get at people. I make pick pick. I'm not making friends. So I come on with my dad, and I go. You know what, Dad? It's like I'm not, I'm not really making friends. He's like, how's how's it going with that? I'm like, I'm not really making friends. It's like not, I'm not from here. It's different, whole different culture, different vibe. You know, people do different stuff. You know, I'm not really making friends. He goes, was well, anybody putting their hands on you? And I'm like, no. He was like, they're just making fun of you, right? And I'm like, yeah. He was like, all right, well, if nobody's putting your hands on, putting their hands on you, that, that's good, because that means you have a choice. If nobody's putting your hands on you. If somebody's putting your hands, they put they're putting their hands on you, you ain't got no choice. Mm-hmm. Somebody's putting their hands on you, son, you ain't got no choice. There's only one thing you can do. But since nobody's putting their hands on you, if it's just words, you got a choice. So your choice is this. Either ignore it or fuck somebody up. He's like, ain't no half-stepping. All right, you start half-stepping now, you're going to half-step for your entire fucking life. Ain't no half-stepping. No half-stepping. He was like, you got full legs, you use them. You got a full dick, you use it. You don't give somebody half your legs, you don't give somebody half your dick. Give them the whole dick, and you don't walk, you run. Ain't no half-stepping. So however you're going to deal with this, fucking deal with it. Don't be half mad. Don't be half all right. Either ignore it or fuck somebody up. The way Drake used to go about shit and how he used to do it, none of that. Two choices. Either ignore it and don't say nothing or fuck Kendrick (laughs) up. All this other shit, Drake didn't done too much. He didn't been around too much. 
He didn't sold too many records. He got too much adulation. He got too much clout. And frankly, Drake is too fucking nice. Too nice on the mic. Too nice with the words. Too nice with it all to have as this. Either ignore it or fuck Kendrick up. That's what you want. That's what has to, that's what has to happen. Ignore or destruction. Well, we'll be waiting. He's going to ignore it. We'll see. All I don't right. think he will. Oh, okay. Tell you thing caps off, but do not stop learning. I'm Van Lathan Jr. I'm Rachel and Lindsay. Okay.